Great. Thank you, David. So we're about to take a break, but I did want to just um, spend a couple minutes uh, to kind of reflect on what we've heard. Um, some of the threads for me were really flexibility, uh, going back to Jane's presentation, um, especially those of you who are relatively new to the profession. The VE process she went through is tremendously difficult. pushes the architecture in ways that usually aren't very good. So struggling through that is a real challenge. You really have to be flexible, I think, as an architect to deal with that. That's one, one thing. You know, we get focused on a certain solution, and good architects are able to take the challenges of budget, which are almost on every project, uh, and hold on to the idea with a new solution. So that flexibility that Jane uh, kind of demonstrated, I think, is really important. Uh, Sarah's um, pop-up hood work is really phenomenal, um, really uh, how quickly the seed of a good ground floor tenant, what that does for a community is, um, is really interesting. And just you talk about going from one block to 15 blocks in a year or so is, is incredible. Um, and to see that sort of aggressiveness with financing and with talking to, I'm sure, a whole bunch of stakeholders, governmental types, is really, is really great. Um, and also, in both uh, uh, Jane and Sarah's uh, discussion, and then to Gray's, the idea of community and how we make community um, and how we talk to each other, uh, I think, is really important. Um, so I think that, that idea that you know we stand together, we're a bit stronger than if we stand alone is something that we're all here, which is good. I congratulate you all for making it here today. That's, I think, a statement about being committed. I won't mention the CEUs, of course. Um, <laughs> but, but I think that idea of community and being engaged is really important. And then, of course, you know, connecting to other communities and, and how we talk. You know, we need to be connected to each other and realize that when we advocate for each other, we're helping everybody out. But then understanding the need, as, as uh, we just heard from David, about how you talk to people who don't understand what a working drawing is or construction documents is, is really important. Um, I'd like to just open it up to any comments or thoughts, hopefully concise ones from the audience. We've got a minute or two and then we'll, we'll break so you can get some more coffee or drinks, but does anybody uh, have any thoughts or ideas or questions for any of the uh, panelists so far? since the bottom fell out of you know, the city in terms of its redevelopment, we've been working with the city to try to figure out what the strategy is. So 
Um, obviously, developers, the city, and the CBDs, which is our the community benefits districts, those are the people that are paying us now. Some of the retailers um, are hiring us to do build out, so we're working with architecture firms to to do that as consultants for just the retail portion. Um, the way that we've structured it, we have to work with brokers, so we get a percentage of their um, whatever fee um, from from the long term lease, which they don't like. But since they weren't doing their job, yeah. we don't care. And it's up, it's really up to the building owner to say, well, actually, you have to work with them because <laughs> they, you know. So it's actually the building owner is a pretty big advocate in the process. Um, there is marketing money available depending on who we're working with. So a huge portion of what we do is more marketing. So if you go to our media page, it's just been, we're in Monocle Magazine this month. It's been. We've been really, really fortunate in the amount of media attention we've got, and that spotlight shines on the retailers. So um, moving forward, we're developing other models about really investing in the small businesses and getting a return from them. But um, I think ultimately it's about partnering with the cities to find the federal money around infrastructure, and we're building our capacity now to really look at it programmatically. So working with the city of Oakland to develop a workforce program that really brings these partnerships together. And that program model is then something that can translate to other cities. So we're actually working with Syracuse, it's north side up, is another really, um, they're three or four, they're four years ahead of us. They're a nonprofit. Well, I had real issues with becoming a nonprofit because I come from the art world and I just I can't handle it. So. Um, <laughs> So it was a very conscious choice to be a for-profit social enterprise, but it is a really nascent industry, and there are um, there is a lot of confusion about where the investment would come in to a model like this. So it's really about us doing a lot of like communication and education, and looking at who are the partnerships, and like, well, let's figure out if we all are partnerships in community revitalization, then you know it has to come from all these different sources. So. Interestingly, the federal funding is starting to shift into a space where it's not just about funding the arts as a marginal production of culture, but as a central way to revitalize communities. So a lot of the federal grants are reframing their money to almost written exactly for what we do. So those are things that we can work with the city to start getting those funds. But it's, it's very in flux, and we're working it out as we go. So if there's some financial geniuses out there, let me know. <laughs> Bring their cards here. Maybe last question from uh, Tibby Rothman. Just so everybody knows, she's a great writer for the LA Weekly, uh, Weekly LA uh, publication uh, writing on the built environment. Actually, I'm here not as a journalist, but to, in an unbiased way, to tweet for the, uh, I'm very honored to tweet for the AIA California Council. It's really great to do that. But what um, was just blowing away me away from Sarah's talk, like I'm so fortunate to get to hear it, is to me, it completely reverses two things about the CRA. It privatizes the CRA, it, that are sort of converse. It privatizes CRAs, which is something that maybe the business community is more interested in, right? But <clears throat> to me, it changes. I can only say this after watching the Los Angeles CRA. You know, I don't want to specify what's been happening up here, but <clears throat> instead of giving money to large huge corporate developers, and, and with all respect, I um, mostly larger architectural firms that have connections to the CRA, it completely disperses that. I think it creates way more opportunities for m many more smaller architects, emerging architects, dare I say, spreads that money around, and like gives and, and spreads really allows the community, it is a community redevelopment agency. But the thing that I want to ask you, I, I, I wanted to say that as a comment. So I, but once that happens, you know, then how do you keep that, those spaces in small communities control versus that it does become more economically viable for larger chains, or is it just a constant lab, right, where you're moving from one community to another community? Um, we're gonna have to 
be measuring that. Like I said, it, we're only a year old, so we're, we're pretty aware that when we communicate to developers and the building owners that the um, that they're partners in the growth of those businesses and the community's success. So that means a very, very gradual uh, and and um, careful analysis of how far they can push the rates up for market, what, whatever the idea of market rate, rent commercial space is, right? So it's a really interesting dynamic in Oakland, which you will not find in Detroit or New Orleans for that matter. Oakland's rents are so depressed next to San Francisco. So eventually, it's just going to be this tipping point. I mean, you can get commercial space for your project at $1.50 a square foot. It's just, and you cannot do that here in, in San Francisco. So what happens when, when that starts to really just overflow into Oakland, right? Even in this bad economy, people are going to start to figure it out. So. In a way, we want that. We want investment in Oakland. We want to create amenities so that firms can do exciting and interesting things and create jobs in Oakland. So we have to be careful about how, how the landlords as individuals perceive their role in that process, that, right? They could be like, oh, great, let's bring the rates up to market rate, like in two years. Well, then that everything crashes because there's just not, it's not sustainable. So. It's really about educating developers and building owners at, that they're part of this gradual process. And if it's local businesses and local people that are, that are doing it, it's not displacement, it's not gentrification, it's actually a robust, sustainable local economy. Linking that globally to other cities, that's a really interesting, exciting thing to think about. So having gone to Melbourne and having gone even to Venice and talk during the Biennale to all these other projects and how they're approaching their cities in Houston and Syracuse and um, down in, um, in New Orleans. There's some really interesting innovative strategies that are grappling with how do, we, how do we link these ideas across cities? How do we build on each other's programs? Where does the money come from? Melbourne's got crazy mad money. <laughs> Oakland's super broke. So, there's different problems, but there's some, some similar solutions that could be tweaked. So the economics of this is something that we'll just have to be tracking over the next year and really measuring it in a meaningful way for other people to, to do something with. If I can uh, jump back in, I know everybody's probably ready for a break, so we'll start up.